Hi, my name is Andrew Lee, and welcome to the Wikimania session on REN, a year in review. REN is the Wikimedians in Residence Exchange Network, and we meet monthly to talk about our various activities as Wikimedians in Residence or those working with professional organizations. You don't have to have the official title of Wikimedian in Residence, and you don't have to be compensated for your work. It's really a network for folks to exchange ideas and experiences on how to better work with external entities and the Wikimedia movement. So typically a lot of us work in the area of GLAM, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, but we're not limited to that. We actually have folks who work with universities, with uh, botanical gardens, or any types of folks who are interested in uh, memory institutions and cultural heritage. So we hope you'll enjoy this series of talks discussing not only topics you might have heard of, like how to run edit-a-thons or how to have better impact, but also some newer topics, perhaps how to work with Wikidata or how to work with structured data on comments and how to bulk upload content to the Wikimedia projects. So hope you'll enjoy these and we welcome any feedback that you might have and we hope you'll join us in discussing many of these topics. Thanks a lot. Dear friends, welcome to this very short presentation of the mutually beneficial collaboration between Wikimedia and WIPO. So my name is Florence Devoir, also known as Anter. In February 2022, I started a part-time pet position as Wikipedia in residence at the World Intellectual Property Organization, also known as WIPO. So what is it? WIPO is one of the 15 specialized agencies of the United Nations. Uh, it was created to promote and protect intellectual property, and its activity include hosting forums to discuss and shape international IP rules and policies, providing global services to register and uh, protect IP or resolve disp disputes, uh, administer 26 uh, international treaties on IP matter. But what is more interesting for us Wikipedian is that they make available a general database on the topic and they produce various reports, statistics, indexes, graphics on the state of IP globally and in specific countries. A year ago, WIPO started working with several Wikipedians on a pilot. And the first outcome of the pilot was very, the first outcomes were very interesting. So they decided to go a step further with a long lasting Wikipedia in residence, me. So um, in the past six months, I have been working with over 10 teams of WIPO experts to facilitate the reuse of their content on the English Wikipedia, on Wikimedia Commons and Wikidata. All of this has been done online through emails, shared documents, online meetings, but I had the joy to visit them in their office in Geneva last week. The first Wikipedia in Residence programs were launched in early 2010s, and the Wikipedia in Residence have been numerous since then. And the collaboration come in very different shape and forms. So I wanted to share a couple of important elements about my own residency. First, we must say that WIPO is a truly an amazing source of information. The content they provide, um, in particular through their databases and reports, is completely aligned with our work. And a lot of it can be reused on, on Wikipedia articles to improve them. And the cherry on the cake is that all WIPO publications are under a CC BY license since 2017. So it has been particularly easy for me to reuse their content. However, I would note that during my residency, I found out that their website were not under a free license. And the work I did on an article using WIPO website content was reverted and hidden for being a copy view. I reported the issue to WIPO and at an amazing speed, the decision was made 
to change the license of the WIPO website to put it under CC BY. I was informed of this last week. It's very brand new. I should also mention that at the same time, WIPO is conducting several efforts to convince other UN agencies to embrace free licensing for their publication. So hopefully it will become easier in the future to collaborate with UN agency. Third, to talk very briefly about content, the improvement I made mostly concern either articles related to WIPO divisions or articles related to IP itself or articles on technological innovation. So topics we have to deal with include, for example, patents, uh, IP policy, cyber squatting, collective right management, and so on. But it also includes articles such as emerging technology, artificial intelligence, assisting technology, more recently, fuel cell vehicles. In some cases, the experts write most of the content to add to Wikipedia, and I boldly edit them um, according to our own expectations, and I explain them why. And I can tell you they had no idea how detail-oriented we are. That was a discovery for them. In other cases, the WIPO experts try to be editors, and my role is to train them and coach them. It's not so easy. And yet in other cases, the experts simply point me to resources and I fully decide what to do with them, what to write. So all of this flows well. There is so much useful content and it is a joy to work with experts and write to the point without fluff. Uh, it's pleasant to have people who understand what the source is and why adding references to an article is something important. Yeah. So to conclude, what are the next steps? Essentially three next steps. First, we will continue to work on the content for Wikipedia, Commons, Wikidata, and hopefully Wikiquote as well. We will also automate the addition of references to WIPO of WIPO publication to Wikidata. And the third one, we intend to expand the work being done in English this year into French and Spanish languages. So yes, we will be looking for Spanish candidates for a Wikipedia in residence position at WIPO. Uh, stay tuned. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi, my name is Jamie Flood. I'm the Wikipedia Median and Residence at the United States Department of Agriculture's National Agricultural Library. I wanted to go over some of the equity and editing program, programming sorry, that we've had over the last year. In 2021, Secretary of Agriculture, Thomas Vilsack, announced new priorities and strategic goals for the department while reinstating equity training and programming. These priorities include diversity and inclusion, nutrition and nutrition security, and climate change. Since then, NAL's programming has focused on issues of equity related to food and nutrition and land access and loss issues for historically excluded communities. Our key collaborators in our efforts have been from the National Agricultural Law Information Partnership, which uh, NAL facilitates, and our two partners are the National Agricultural Law Center in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems at Vermont Law School. They've been key players in helping us find research and secondary publications that we we're able to use to edit around these topics, uh, as well as providing us with speakers, if not be they themselves speaking. Uh, Quickly, I do want to say as an aside, if you're interested in agriculture or agricultural law, uh, even if you aren't in the United States, please still reach out. Uh, we are we can connect you with people closer to you if we can if we're unable to help for whatever reason. This year, we have hosted a number of events, probably the most events that we've hosted so far. Uh, we have hosted four events this year and we will be hosting a fifth in September, 
and potentially another one, and we're hoping to do a few more next year. This year, our first event was on Ayers property and featured experts Mavis Gregg of the Forest Foundation and her own company, Airshares, and Francine Miller of CAFS, which is the Center for Agriculture and Food Systems. Ayers property is a key contributor to land loss for African Americans and indigenous peoples on tribal lands here in the United States, uh, but it also affects Latinx folks in the Southwest and families in Appalachia. Heirs property is a, occurs when someone dies without a will, or which is interstate, and they leave land and property to multiple heirs. When this happens, it's often left without a clear title, which can affect ownership and leaves families vulnerable to predatory developers who are able to swoop in and force sale of that land and purchase it for a much lower price than it's actually worth. Second, we had an event on food equity featuring the Reverend Dr. Heber Brown III of the Black Church Food Security Network in Baltimore, Maryland. And with him, we discussed local food systems and food access, as well as food apartheid, and the meaning of food and agriculture to Africans and African Americans. As an aside, I do wanna say that all of these events have been recorded. We're working on getting those recordings up on our website, but if you're interested, please let me know and I'm happy to share those with you. Uh, our third event was on nutrition security and featured Dr. Sarah Bleich, the Director of Nutrition Security and Health Equity at USDA, Dr. Maya Moroto from Partnership for a Healthy America, and Dr. Tanya Augers Collins of the uh, National Institute for Health, and Leilani Nelson, again from CAPS. We discussed the emerging topic of nutrition security and how nutrition and food security is often because of the lack of access to healthy food in particular, not just food in general, um, and contributes to health disparities across communities, particularly uh, historically excluded communities. And then we also covered what the government, the federal government, as well as these nonprofit organizations are doing to help address issues of nutrition security. And then finally, we recently had an event on cooperative agriculture featuring Terrence Courtney of the Federation for Southern Cooperatives and Doug O'Brien, the CEO and president of the National Cooperative Business Association. And they discussed the importance of cooperatives for improving land access and as well as access to knowledge, uh, information, training, equipment, and capital for those involved. Doug also talked about the procedures that are needed in order to set up a cooperative. I also wanted to go over some of the things that we've learned over the past year, which has honestly been a lot. One of the key things we've learned is that great speakers and other educational opportunities outside of just editing really helps draw in more people. Uh, by changing up how we offer these events, our attendance has grown from about 60 people to 150 to 180. Uh, fo focusing editing efforts also makes learning how to edit feel less daunting. And what I mean by that is I've shortened our work list. I used to create work lists with 30 to 50 uh, articles on them. And now I focus on usually 10 to 15. And that will usually include one to two new articles, but mostly focused on content that already exists. Another aspect of that is um, including notes around the articles that need to be edited with some ideas of what could be edited in that article, as well as references that could potentially be used um, in editing that article. Uh, I've also shortened our editing training and really base it more on what the audience might be looking for. So when I'm working with students, I focus on writing new articles. When I'm within USDA, I focus on adding citations and doing grammar edits. Uh, we've also, are seeing Wikipedia as a vehicle for knowledge equity. There are issues for historically excluded communities that aren't well covered on Wikipedia, and I think it's important work that could be done, but it's essential to pull the references for those from a wide variety of sources to fully um, create the picture of, of that issue or related issues, if you will. 
In the coming year, we'll be expanding our collaborations and topics doing more with air's property and nutrition security and looking to cover topics like climate change, climate and environmental justice, urban agriculture and agricultural workers. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much. Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Lawrence and I'm a research fellow in Open Knowledge Systems at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm also a Wikimedian in residence one day a week at the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society. Uh, the centre um, was established as a multi institutional uh, research centre in 2021 uh, to study how automation is impacting society, including in news and media, transport and mobility, health, and social services. And it's interested in looking at this from a range of perspectives, including data, machines, people, and institutions. The centre director was interested in having a Wikimedian in residence, as he, uh, Julian Thomas, as he has a strong understanding of the importance of Wikimedia as a platform across the knowledge ecosystem, and also of the importance of Wikipedia as a source of knowledge, particularly on complex research issues, such as the, what the centre was studying. The aims of the residency were a bit vague at first, and I must admit it has been hard to find clear guidance on what a Wikimedian in residence role should be. So this is definitely something that we need to have a think about, particularly in relation to research centres rather than GLAM institutions, and particularly research centres in the social sciences and humanities. So based on uh, my year of engaging with researchers at the centre, I've come up with around six key uh, aims and outcomes. So a key part of it has been awareness, increasing the awareness and engagement with Wikimedia platforms by ADMS researchers, training such as editathons and so on, content, uh, the profile of the centre, analysis and exchange. And I'll just briefly go through some of the things that I did as part of uh, those areas. So one of the first things to think about was uh, the profile of the project itself. Uh, this itself was a little unsure where and how to set up a project page. So in the end, I went with the GLAM uh, project and added a page there. I put a disclaimer on my own page. Um, I added a page on ADMS as a centre on Wikipedia uh, so that uh, people would understand where it fitted in the system. I uh, also added ADMS researchers and partners to Wikidata and was then able to do some visualisations with that area. And to do that, I needed to add uh, Australian Research Council grant IDs. So there was a bit of work in just setting up the project itself. One of the key areas that Wikimedians in residence often work on is training. So I ran an editathon supported by Wikimedia Australia in October. And we got about 11 uh, people, to, editors to come along to that and edited 20 articles. So that was good, but it was difficult to engage academic researchers uh, in, in that kind of basic training. Uh, so I then did fortnightly drop-in sessions for about two months, and that, that was much better to be able to have individual conversations with researchers about their projects. A key uh, focus has been on uh, pages and content on Wikipedia. So we set up a page on automated decision-making and uh, a page on digital inclusion, because neither of those pages were actually there. And there's been a lot of effort to engage across uh, other pages that already existed, such as algorithm, digital divide, crowdsourcing, even something like domestic violence, because technology-aided uh, uh, violence is, uh, was a key thing that one of our researchers was looking at, uh, online advertising, and quite a few others that we've uh, been looking at and editing over time and supporting uh, the experts in the centre to also edit these pages. It then uh, I became more and more aware of uh, the importance of actually presenting Wikimedia as a platform and helping researchers, particularly researchers who are studying the internet, uh, to understand how Wikimedia 
uh, operates uh, as a platform. Uh, in uh, May this year, I ran a seminar called Automating Wikimedia, Open Knowledge, Link Data and Search, and involved um, uh, Professor Mark Sanderson, who's a search engine expert, Liam Wyatt from the Wikimedia Foundation, and Professor Heather Ford at the University of Technology, Sydney, who's a Wikimedian and has also just got a uh, significant research grant to look at uh, Australian content on Wikipedia. And then finally, one of the key areas has been knowledge exchange, which I think of as a sort of package of, uh, of just by, by virtue of being in the role, uh, opportunities uh, develop kind of off platform. So advocacy has been a big area. I've supported um, and contributed to submissions on open access, uh, copyright and online digital safety uh, to the Australian government. Uh, I've helped with partnerships uh, with other GLAM organisations such as ACME that's interested in engaging uh, with uh, Wikipedia more and uh, was also already engaged with the centre. Uh, I've done presentations and outreach to other universities that might be interested in having a Wikimedian in residence and developing guidelines for Wikimedian in residences with Wikimedia Australia and working on projects and plans with, for the future of many of the researchers at the centre. So that's just a quick overview of some of the things that a, a researcher, um, a, a Wikimedian at a research centre might think about doing. I hope it's useful. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rachel Helps. I'm the Wikipedian in residence at the library at Brigham Young University. And this is my presentation on why make Wikimedians in residence should edit Wikipedia. And um, in case you're not familiar with paid editing, it, there's a bit of a controversy over it, but um, this chart from Andrew Lee's excellent presentation on paid editing from 2014 illustrates that um, being paid doesn't necessarily mean you're conflicted you can be conflicted and unpaid and um, also unconflicted and paid. And I'm not getting into that now, but happy to talk about it later. So what's the problem with Wikipedia that Wikimedians and residents are helping? Well, Wikipedia has these content gaps. Uh, what is a content gap? Here's an example. Here's a list of books that have won the Caldecott Award. It's an award for picture books issued by the American Library Association. And you can see that for these early years, there's pages for all of the books, even the, even you know, the uh, honorable mentions. Um, here's a list of books that have won the Coretta Scott King Book Award. And um, you can see that not as many of the um, books have blue links. This is a, uh, the Coretta Scott King Book Award is an award for children's books written by uh, black authors and or illustrators, also issued by the American Library Association. So this is just an example of a content gap. It's um, pretty common with children's media that's older for some reason and also for works by people of color. So uh, why does Wikipedia have content gaps? Well, we don't really know why. It's just that no volunteer has written it yet, but we can, we can make some educated guesses. We know there's a contributor gap. Most of our Wikipedia editors are um, white men who are interested in the internet and um, the interests and therefore content created by typical Wikipedia editors doesn't really reflect the literally encyclopedic needs of Wikipedia. And um, one reason more women may not be editing Wikipedia, according to data feminism, is that they don't have as much time to edit. Another reason put forward by the study, um, anyone can edit, not everyone does, Wikipedia's infrastructure and the gender gap is that the legalistic framework that Wikipedia is based on can be unwelcoming. There is also an interest gap. The, we sort of touched on that. The people most interested in the topics that are boring to the current editors are um, not being written. <laughs> one, uh, one interest gap I noticed is that there aren't very many books on fine press, fine presses. Um, th these are like really nice books that are made with an old fashioned letterpress. And for some reason, those kind of people aren't also interested in editing, editing Wikipedia, um, but I might be help. I'm I'm already working to fill that gap. I made a page on the Kelmscott Press, and there's also a source gap. New sources kind of cover some topics and not others, and um, researching topics outside of pop recent popular culture is a more specialized skill. And also, some sources are inaccessible to a typical volunteer. And um, if you're working in a library, you have access to lots more sources than a typical volunteer. 
um, still speaking on sources, um, that why would the source gap explain the content gap? Well, Wikipedia distills biases present in the sources that we're using, including the lack of those sources. Okay, so back to Wikimedians and residents. They can and are helping to fill those content gaps. And um, Wikimedia Foundation has defined these content gaps. They've organized them into categories. They looked at all these studies to sort of um, figure out what the topics are. And the topics um, with content gaps that I'm going to be discussing today are cultural background, gender, important topics, and language. And you'll notice important topics, it's just to find this differences in coverages of topics that are of common interest. So well, we'll come back to that later. Okay, cultural background and gender. Um, this page on Teresa Clyborne was created by Mia Cariello, who had a paid internship with the Smithsonian. She created this page and 17 others and added over a thousand references to various pages. She also created the page Asian Americans documentary series and edited many pages on African American culinary experts and indigenous activism. Jamie Flood created this page on Shavonda Jacobs Young, and uh, Flood works as a Wikimedian in residence at the U.S. Department of Agriculture National Agricultural Library. She created this page um, on Shavonda Jacobs Young, who was the uh, is the first woman and person of color to be the Undersecretary of Agriculture for Research, Education, and Economics. And um, I've also done some work on the Mormon culture pages. Um, actually, not the Mormon culture page itself, but pages like this Mormon fiction page, um, which um, there's less of a gap now because I've been doing so much work on them. Uh, here's important topics. Remember, these are just like topics that are important, but no one's done work on, so sometimes they're kind of boring. But um, the discovery and early development of insulin, I think we would all agree this is an important topic that maybe we wouldn't work on in our free time. Uh, Ji Yun, Alex Jung at the University of Toronto, he developed multiple pages on this. And another important topic is workplace exposure monitoring. And John P. Sadowski, who works at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, created this page. Um, another example is this page on Ashok Gadgil that Mary Mark Ackerbloom has improved extensively. Um, she, she did some more technical reporting on his research, but um, I just wanted to highlight this Darfur Stoves project because um, I thought it was interesting and I don't often read about um, so, sometimes it, um, like the um, the projects on women that scientists are involved in uh, don't get as much coverage. Language is the next one. Uh, Tochi Precious is the Wikimedia in residence at the Moleskine Foundation, Moleskine Notebooks, and she translated this page uh, for the Ijele Masquerade into Igbo, which is an indigenous language in Nigeria. And um, she also added the Makua language of Mozambique and the Lagoli language of Kenya to the incubator to possibly get their own Wikipedias. Thank you for watching. I'm Hi, welcome to the Ren Year in Review for the Met Museum at Wikimania 2022. I'm Andrew Lee, the, the Wikimedia strategist. I'm Jeannie Choi, General Manager of Collection Information at the Met. So we thought we'd just give you an overview of kind of where we are with uh, our Met work and Jeannie will tell us a little bit about our history. Um, we started in 2017 when we uploaded um, over 375,000 of our public domain images to Wikimedia Commons with the help of Richard Nipel, our then Wikimedia in residence. And since then, um, the monthly views of our images on Wikipedia have gone, uh, they're over 336 million per month. Um, so and it's about represents about 6% of our images that we've contributed have been used in articles. Great. And one of the things that we're doing right now is working with structured data on commons to add more metadata so that we can make them more discoverable. So one of the things we've been doing is running something like the Metbot, uh, a Python bot to bring over some very well researched uh, keyword depiction information from the Met API to structured data on commons. We've done a lot already with Wikidata, but with the advent of SDC, this gives 
meaningful depiction information to every comments file, not just objects that are notable enough to be in Wikidata. So what has really helped is to add the met object ID, a unique identifier for every object the met has, and collection information, including the department at the met. So this allows us to, in the future, come up with a nice browsing or searchable discovery interface for met files once we have all this information that's there. So another thing we're doing also is adding constituent information, very precise constituent IDs that the Met has as a unique identifier for all the artists in their database. And you can see here in the upper left-hand corner, this is what comes back from the Met uh, API. When you actually look up an artwork, it actually gives you the constituent ID from the Met as a unique identifier, the name, the role, and also uh, they are tracking the Wikidata queue number for this. and the Getty ULAN ID. So this is great in terms of having all three things here. And we're starting to put the Met constituent ID into every single uh, Wikidata item that corresponds to the artist. So, so far you can see our work has matched, you know, tens of thousands of human uh, artists there, but constituents are not just people. They can be businesses, fashion houses, enterprises, studios, or even art museums themselves. So we're uh, adding these in a systematic way using the Met API and a bot. So we've had this internal debate about, um, you know, where we should spend our resources, whether it's on Wikidata and Commons. Wikidata is great for structured, uh, translated data, but we have many more items on Commons. We have about 20,000 Wikidata items, but we have 375,000 files on Commons, and we want to make them discoverable. So do where do we spend our energy? Adding more Wikidata items or adding more uh, structured data to Commons? Right, and for a lot of contemporary artworks, we may not have a Wikidata item yet, but we don't have a Commons file because we're not free. So I'm sure a lot of folks are also wrestling with this problem in terms of what happens when you have things are lower notability, but we don't have a free image file for them. And in terms uh, of notability, just real quick, um, our things are already on commons. Um, and so does that make them notable? And they are in the Met collection. So does that make them notable? So these are the sort of discussions we're having internally. Yeah. And in addition to all that, the, some of the tools that we're using, we're using a best combination right now, maybe quick statements, which is very basic support for structured data on commons, but quick statements can also just mysteriously stop working. And that's been a real blocker for a lot of the things we're doing. Open Refine is being developed right now with a dedicated team. It's great to see that, but Open Refine can be kind of tough to learn. So there's a lot of capabilities there, but also a big learning curve. Um, so a lot of this comes down to custom tools and bots that we're writing. Uh, Wiki Commons query service, very powerful, really cool, but it requires you to log in to work in order to ensure scalability and performance. So that's a big bummer because a lot of tools and techniques that we are used to using in Wikidata just don't work once you put authentication into the mix, including the lack of demo ability to the public. And then um, we'd like to see more tools like PetScan and PY Wikibot be more SDC aware, structured data and commons aware. Um, some of the things we're working on is also to get back to using AI to predict uh, more depiction information for artworks so that we can enrich the data set even more and also better methods for round tripping data so we can have data flow back and forth between the glam entity and Wikidata and structured data on commons and maybe we need to work with other folks to come up with a framework and not just write our own bots to do all this um, but we'd also love to measure more impact which Jeannie will talk about. Yes, one of our great challenges is I need to go to my boss and our executives to explain the impact all the work we're doing um, is have with Wikimedia and Wikidata, all the impact it's having. And it's very difficult to get these uh, specific analytics, especially around departments and particular files. Um, and we want to get analytics because we want it to guide our future work. What's lacking? What, what should we be contributing? Uh, which foreign languages are seeing the most growth on Wikipedia? What drives growth in article views? And what um, what what content should we be adding? What types of images should we be adding? And I'd, we'd love to get um, usage data on voice assistants like um, Siri and Alexa. Yeah, so these are not easy things, but those are just some of the things that we're working on. And uh, we hope to give you an update on them as we make progress on them. Thanks a lot.
Hello everyone and thank you for joining. Um, my name is Dechi Precious and I'm the Wikimedia in Residence at the Moskin Foundation. Um, also, thank you to the Wikimedia team for the opportunity. Um, today, I'm going to be sharing the overview of my year as a Wikimedia in Residence at the, at the Moskin Foundation, working under the Wiki Africa Education Project. As a Wikimedia in Residence um, at the Moskin Foundation, I worked under the Wiki Africa Education Project. And the Wiki Africa Education Project is an empowerment project that amplifies voices from Africa to reflect the rich and valuable history, languages, people, and communities of the continent. The vision of Wiki Africa Education Project project is to inspire a new generation of African creative thinkers and doers to increase by increasing production, access and awareness of contextually and linguistically relevant knowledge resources from Africa. The focus or the group focus of this project is young Africans from ages 18 to 27. Now, when you come to the Wiki Africa Education Project, um, there are two different programs under this project. We have the Higher Education Initiative and then we have the Afro Curation um, Program. On the Higher Education Initiative is um, an initiative by Moskin Foundation with um, Fondazione Aurora as its partner. And the aim of this initiative is to train African language speakers at higher education institutions, both in Italy and Africa, to create content relevant to their fields of study and expertise in African languages, therefore reducing um, global and intellectual, global intellectual inequalities. So the program trains the participants to be autonomous knowledge producers, and it gives them a deep foundation of the Wikipedia platform, the Wikidata platform, the Wiki Commons platform, and it also follows them during the process of um, content creation and production. The next um, program is the Afro Curation Program. And for the year 2021 and um, early 2022, we worked under the theme of who we are. Now the Afro Curation Program is a cultural and inspirational experience where participants feel empowered to create knowledge about their culture, an identity and redressing the historical bias and also taking ownership of the digital um, narrative. Now the next I'm going to talk about is the outcome of the Wiki Africa Education Project. Now for this Wiki Africa Education Project between the year 2021 to um, the first half of 2022, we had 10 university partners in Italy and Africa going to be mentioning them later on. Um, we had five cultural partners, which included a tally publishing in Mozambique. Um, one, two kit was developed and translated into three um, different languages, which includes Swahili, Portuguese, and French. And the essence of this is to um, give a foundation for the translation of these, um, these two kits into other African languages. Now, um, across um, the project, uh, across this time, we had 600 participants and um, over 2000 articles were produced on Wikipedia, Wikidata, and which also including um, uploads to Wikicommons. Now, um, during this time also, 11, 14 languages or 14 African languages were covered as well. And these languages included Olaf, Twi, Swahili, um, Zulu, um, Sosa and a whole lot of other languages from various um, African countries. And during this period, two new language Wikipedias were created. The Logoli Wiki language Wikipedia was added to the incubator. Logoli is a language from Kenya. And also the Makua language of um, Mozambique was added to the incubator. Um, furthermore, one volunteer community was created in Mozambique where there was none existent before. And um, this volunteer community is to um, help in the content production in the Makwa Wikipedia, which is a language spoken by over 6 million people in Mozambique but has no digital footprint until the Afro Curation Project. And during this time, we also had um, partner, we partnered with three um, Wikimedia user groups which includes Wikimedia, of, um, Wikimedia Tanzania, the Tree Community um, User Group, and um, 
with their South Africa. And also we had volunteers from four user groups, which includes um, Brazil, Portugal, Nigeria, Italy, and so on. Um, in terms of universities, we partnered with University of Naples Federico II, we partnered with Politecnico di Milano, UM di Milano, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Italy, um, Sapienza University, AMREF, and um, um, AMREF AMU University in Kenya. Highlights of the year. For me, the highlight of the year was getting the Macworld video. Um, the, the Makwa language Wikipedia into the incubator um, because the Makwa language is, like I said, is a language spoken by over 6 million people in Mozambique but had no digital footprint prior to the afro curation program. That's to say that there were no blogs, no articles like digitally written in the language apart from Bible translations um, of the language and also creating a volunteer community in Mozambique, which um, is working to keep the um, language Wikipedia alive. And another highlight is the language revi revitalization, which the Wiki Africa Education Project has shown in the areas of adding the logo to Wikipedia into the incubator and also revitalizing the Makwa language Wikipedia. Um, next, I'm going to show you the participants' feedback. There were lots of um, feedback, but I'm just going to share one. Um, this is from Palmyra. She's 24 years and she's from Mozambique. She said, participating in the Wikipedia training was a very fascinating experience, and more so because it's a local language marginalized by some who unfortunately still carry the idea of the existence of language superiority. And um, Palmyra is an is a Makwa speaker, Makwa language speaker from Mozambique. Now, what does the future look like for the um, Wiki Africa Education Project? We are hoping to partner and get involved with more Wiki communities. Like um, for the first phase, we there weren't so many, but for this year and next year, we hope to partner with more. And we also hope to do more with um, Wiki data, um, get more descriptions and items written in more African languages. And we also hope to have more um, African voices to contribute knowledge in English, French, and various African languages, and also change Africa's narrative on Wikimedia projects. Because um, thematically, or because like we all know, they, they are actually more articles written about the city of Paris in France than Africa, the continent Africa as a whole. Hence, we are working to change that narrative. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And if you're looking forward to get involved or you're thinking of um, how to get involved, let's discuss, just reach out to me at um, thechipressures2 at gmail.com. Thank you. Hello all, my name is Mike Dickerson and I'm the Vice President of Wikimedia Aotearoa New Zealand, a giant flightless birds on the wikis. And I'd like to tell you about a project called the West Coast Wikipedian at Large. First, what a Wikipedian at Large is in contrast to a Wikipedian in Residence. And secondly, the two separate projects we've run now on the West Coast of New Zealand and why we've chosen this approach. Um, I thought I dreamed up the term Wikipedian at large when I applied for a project grant in 2018, but it turns out a couple of people had used it before. But the idea was to run numerous different Wikipedian um, associations with organizations throughout the country, 35 in fact in the end, rather than be a Wikipedian in residence at just one. And this was because the general level of engagement and understanding with Wikimedia projects and the GLAM and other institutions in New Zealand at the time was actually quite low. People didn't really know or understand or appreciate what they could do by working with Wikimedia projects. So I spent a year traveling the length of the country from north to south, trying to raise public awareness, training, set up regular meetups, organize bulk photo uploads, and show organizations why they should be taking Wikipedia seriously. 
Uh, and it was uh, a great but very, very grueling experience, but I could see the advantage of it in a, pop in a large dispersed population. At the end of the project, I wound up living in Hokitika on the South uh, Island of New Zealand, on about halfway down, uh, on the West Coast, which is a uh, very low population density, only 35,000 people spread over in nearly 600 kilometers. Um, so there's no large institution that one could be a Wikipedian in residence in. I pitched to Development West Coast, which is a business development and tourism support organization, uh, to tr perhaps fund me for a couple of months at a time to try and improve the coverage of the West Coast in Wikipedia. And they could see that there would be, you know, business and tourism um, benefits from this. So they were happy to um, support me in it. So I ran the first Wikipedian at large on the West Coast uh, in 2020, and we're, I'm halfway through the second one. Um, the way these are organized is that we recruit a team of volunteers. So I've got 10 working with me at the moment, most of them all around New Zealand and a couple in Australia. Uh, we touch base regularly and work on projects together. Mostly I'm uh, working from Hokitika on the West Coast, but I've been doing field trips for several days at a time to different areas, mostly to take photographs of missing gaps in, in Wikipedia or Wikidata, but also to meet with locals and get access to uh, print materials and resources that aren't online or even in libraries. And this has been really valuable to get people to produce their photo albums, their media clippings, and their tiny small press publications that are otherwise really hard to find. The or organization of it is by area. Volunteers have a list of Wikidata items and Wikipedia articles that need work and can work on them in the usual way. Uh, but we try and focus for two weeks at a time on a particular area, and we try and coordinate our efforts. Uh, the first time through, we coordinated um, with uh, the second with daily reporting. Uh, this was a bit too much pressure on volunteers. We found trying to come up with something every day to report, uh, so we switched to weekly reporting this time round, and that's working much better. Of course, we do have a project dashboard that logs a lot of these achievements, but the volunteers find this actually quite useful to be able to ask questions and chat with each other uh, as part of the reporting to help each other out or, or you know, summon, summon assistance if needed. We also, I also report to the volunteer team uh, with postcards, and these are virtual postcards that appear on their talk pages every week or two weeks. Uh, they thank them, always thank them. We go through what has been achieved in the last couple of weeks, particularly highlights like getting 400,000 views for a video in DYK, which was amazing. Uh, let them know what the key tasks coming up are, what we're going to be focusing on, uh, where I'm going to be and what I can do to help. Uh, we illustrate it with a photo taken by a volunteer. And it's, of course, the totem insect of the West Coast is the sandfly. Um, so that appears on the stamp. Uh, we also have a little badge that we can send to them uh, to say thank you if they've been participating especially well. So part of the reporting is the photo uploads. We try and do galleries and detailed reporting of how many different commons categories we've created, how many articles we've created at the end of the project. Uh, so this can all be shared by, with Development West Coast who have been really great. They've put out press releases. They've gotten um, coverage of this in all the local papers. They got me onto breakfast television to talk from my home about Wikipedia. And the, even a camera crew appeared out in the field to film me typing, editing Wikipedia live by a lake. By, you couldn't see all the sandflies that were eating me alive at the time. So this has been, I think, a real success and a really potentially useful model for a Wikipedian residents. It's not your traditional Wikipedian sitting in an institution, but actually out in the field, uh, doing photography, working with locals, but being supported by a big team of volunteers. I'm happy to chat with this if anyone's got questions or would like to perhaps run this in your own patch. Uh, easy to get in touch with me. Thank you very much.